Hello and welcome to the Facts Over Fandom show. My name is Brandon Podgorski. I am your host and I am so happy you're joining us today. And I hope if you're joining us, if you're watching us on YouTube, that's great. Check us out, youtube.com slash FOF underscore show. But I hope if you're listening, you're listening on Spotify. That is the preferred place to listen to us. Uh, just do a search on Spotify for Facts Over Fandom. And it's great to be with you this week. I mean, I, I put this out on social media on the Facts Over Fandom. And please follow us on social media. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. That's the only place to follow us on Facts Over Fandom. Both hand, handles for both accounts, Twitter, Instagram, at FOF underscore show. Is this the best four weeks of the sports calendar? Now, it's hard because we're not in football right now, and, and I know we love football, but we've got three weeks of March Madness. We have opening day for baseball, and there's just something about opening day, spring. I'm here in northern Indiana, and it's it's been nice the past few days. Um, we're getting close to Easter. Um, there's just something about it, and, and opening day is just kind of that kickoff of spring. And now this weekend, we, we've got the Masters. Masters just started here just a couple hours ago. I'm recording on Thursday. This is going to drop on Friday. I don't know if there's a better four weeks in the sports calendar right now. So I'm certainly fired up. Uh, I'm ready for spring. I'm ready for warmer weather and just ready for a, a great summer at the ballpark. As my son gets older, I'm really looking forward to taking him out and, and watching a few both minor league and, and major league games. So that's going to be fun this summer. But today's topic, what we're going to talk about today is the title of the show, How to Poach a Coach. And I did a video on this, I think, last weekend or, or, or the weekend before uh, when FAU was making their run and they were playing in the final four. And the head coach of Florida Atlantic is Dusty May. And Dusty May graduated from Indiana University. We were there at the same time. I'm an IU grad. He was a manager for the basketball team uh, when Bob Knight was the head coach. And there was some chatter online with uh, fans and I'm going to I'm going to pull this up as as I'm talking here so I'm sorry sorry if you're watching us on YouTube and I'm looking off the screen uh, just kind of ignore that right now uh, I, sh I probably should have had this ready but there was some chatter online from IU fans as I'm kind of um, following along online on Twitter and just seeing you know what uh, some IU basketball fans are talking about about hey do we bring Dusty May to IU now it's a little bit peculiar because Mike Woodson has only been there for two years. IU guy, played under night, coached in the NBA for a long time. And I don't, he's not, he doesn't have IU to the level that fans expect to be uh, uh, for IU to be at. And, and certainly not probably where he wants IU to be at right now, but at least hey, they've gone to the tournament the past two years. Uh, they made a pass the first round this year. Again, that's nothing to to write home about or be excited about if you're an IU fan. But it's certainly better than um, what what they had previously under Archie Miller. But fans already started to ask, hey, you know, do we bring Dusty May in? You know, Mike Woodson, I believe he's 65 years old. Um, at the end of his contract, he's still got four more years. He's going to be pushing 70. You know, do we think about this? Do you strike when the iron's hot? So I was thinking about this show, and, and I did a video on it on Instagram, about a four-minute video on, on why that seems unlikely. But as I was thinking about what am I going to do for a topic for this show, I want to share, this is from the Indie Star Sports Instagram account, and this was posted um, on April 5th. And it's a picture uh, of Mike Woodson and, and Dusty May, and the caption, and this was from a column written um, by Greg Doyle, the caption is, nobody is pushing out Mike Woodson, but Dusty May is next. So let me show you, let me read the rest of this, um, the rest of the description here on, uh, on, the, uh, on the post. Mike Woodson is two years into his return to his alma mater, winning enough games and landing enough talent and being cool and charismatic and kind enough to entering beloved territory with his employers, his players, and his fan base. Before taking upstart FAU to the 2023 Final Four, Dusty May was the student manager for Bob Knight at IU. Someday he'll become the head coach at IU. That first sentence is a fact. The sentence, sen sentence feels like a lock. And then you can click on and, and read the rest of that story. So basically, they're kind of hinting that, you know, Dusty May is, is the guy in waiting. And 
Um, again, just kind of looking at the the message boards, some fans were thinking, well, do we go ahead and bring him in now? So uh, I'm going to address specifically the the IU, and I don't want to call it situation. I don't think it's a situation, but uh, maybe the wish list uh, of IU fans. But more broadly, how do these coaching changes happen in sports? So uh, I coach college basketball now, albeit at, at lower levels. Um, for I think about six years, and uh, I was an AD for for two years. Um, actually, no, I coached closer to ten. Yeah, I'm sorry, I coached closer to ten years and was an AD for a couple of years. So I got a little bit of experience in this, um, and it's it's interesting. So so let's just walk through IU, and I've got some notes as I look off screen here that I that I wanted to go over. So, you know, when Mike Woodson was brought in a couple of years ago. Um, Archie Miller was a head coach at IU and he still had a couple years left on his contract and he had over 10 million, about 10.35 million remaining on his contract. So if you're going to get rid of a coach, you're going to fire a coach. Um, they're not going to go quietly into that good night. You're going to have to pay them the remainder of their contract. Now, how much that's going to be, it can depend and you can always negotiate um, buyouts, but for the most part, you're going to give them, you know, what we would call in corporate America, a uh, golden parachute. So Archie Miller's buyout was $10.35 million. Now, you've heard me talk about on a, on a previous show, college athletic departments, you know, despite what people think, are not swimming in money. Uh, most college de athletic departments actually operate in the red. And so to come up with $10.35 million um, to, to buy out a coach isn't just necessarily a fe uh, uh, feasible thing for most athletic departments. So um, the buyout for Archie Miller um, was actually paid for by anonymous donors. So the fan base basically got sick enough of not going to the tournament where they said, hey, listen, we're going to pull together our money. We're going to give you $10.35 million, get him out and get a new coach in. Now, you know, that sounds all well and good if you think you got a home run higher in waiting. Um, but you know, you are given a little bit of that of control to your donor base. And, you know, that could be good, but it could also be a bad thing if you get the wrong person in there. Now, I think time will tell with Mike Woodson. He's doing a good job so far. He, he's he got good progress so far. It seems like recruiting is going okay. Um, but at the end of the day, you got to win games. You know, it, it doesn't matter if um, you're a, a beloved former player and uh, you played for a beloved former coach and, and you're bringing in alumni into the program. Um, you you got to win games. And um, I think time will tell on, on how much patience fans will have um, with Mike Woodson. Again, I think the trajectory, I butchered that, the trajectory is going the right way. Um, but, um, you know, I think this next season will be telling as he lose two, loses two of his star players. So let's jump into it. Okay, let's just say for argument's sake that IU is going to bring Dusty May in because you got to strike when the iron's hot. Uh, FAU is being smart right now. I just saw a report that they are going to sign Dusty May to uh, an extension, and, and ostensibly it's going to double what he's making right now. He's going to be making close to a million dollars, and they're going to be putting millions of dollars into into facilities and into the program and. Um, in, in other things in the athletic department. So um, that's smart on FAU's part um, because the higher that they pay him, the hard, the bigger the buyout's going to be. And maybe it that um, puts some of those suitors at bay. Maybe. I mean, if donors are willing to pay $10.35 million to, um, to fire a coach, they're going to be willing to pay $10.35 million um, to bring their guy in. Um, at IU might be a little bit more difficult. You you just did this two years ago where you got rid of a coach. I don't know if necessarily there's a, there's a fever pitch to do that right now. Um, so with um, Mike Woodson, he's got a base salary of five hundred fifty thousand dollars and an additional two point four five million from um, marketing and, and promotional income. So he makes about three million dollars a year. Um, the marketing and promotional income, you know, it could be you know his his coaches show and and maybe um, you know uh, appearances, um, possibly a little bit with Adidas. Although that that deals um, there is a, a clause with Adidas in the contract where you get so much money and and what he can spend. Um, basically gets a credit on the stuff that he wants to get from Adidas. So all that stuff kind of plays in there, right there from Mike Woodson. Bottom line makes $3 million a year. If IU wanted to move on, 
and they thought bringing in Dusty May was just going to be the home run hire. He's the next big thing. We cannot wait four more years for Mike Woodson's contract to end. We got to bring him bring him in right now. You got options as the AD, and I don't know if any of them are necessarily really good, which is why I think this is far fetched, not impossible. I've seen weirder things happen in college athletics, um, but I think you could do a number of things. One, if you just wanted to tell Mike Woodson, thank you for your service. Really appreciate you getting IU back on, on track and where they need to be. But we want to bring in Dusty May. He's uh, considerably younger. He's this hot commodity. He just took FAU to the final four. Um, we're going to buy out the rest of your contract uh, because you're being fired. You're basically being fired um, without cause. So we owe you 100 percent on the rest of your contract for these remaining four years. Um, so four times three million, if my IU math is correct, would be 12 million dollars. Uh, we're going to pay that to you and then we're going to bring this new coach in. Right. So you just had donors two years ago pay over $10.3 million, get rid of a coach. Um, you're going to have to go back to those coffers again and ask for $12 million to get rid of a coach who has not lost. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tough pitch, right? And if you're the AD at IU, Scott Dolson, it, is that the type of AD you want to be known as? Um, we are kind of running off um, one of your alumni, a guy who played in the program, um, a guy who's who's won the past two years and seems to be doing a decent job on the recruiting front. Um, is that kind of what you want to be known as? And, and I don't know. I, I, I've i never met Scott Dolson, never had a conversation with him. Um, I think you can wrestle with that decision, though, um, and say, you know, you, you might not get a second bite at the apple. You know, this may be the only time where you're going to have an opportunity to get a guy like Dusty May to come in and he got to do it. You know, um, any any blowback um, or uh, repercussions kind of be damned. I, I got to do it because I think this is the guy who's going to be the home run hire who's going to take IU basketball to the next level for the next 15, 20 years. Maybe, maybe, you know, as I shrug my shoulders, you can't see it on the podcast, but as I do that here on YouTube. So that's one option there. I think another option you could look at is do you bring him in to be the head coach at waiting and waiting? So something interesting, um, Mike Woodson's contract, he would be owed 100% of his contract if he's fired within his first four years. After his fourth year, so on April 2nd, um, 2025, he would only be owed 50% of his remaining contract. So if there were two years remaining on his contract, that would be $6 million, 50% um, of that. Uh, would be uh, three, probably a little easier pitch to make to uh, to the to the alumni base or to your donor base to come up with three million to bring Dusty May in. Now that is fraught full of risk. You know, one, uh, are you going to tick off your head coach for doing something like that? You know, I, I mean, just think about it. If you're a uh, you're a manager, you're a high level executive somewhere, whatever it is, and and, and you seem to be doing a, a decent job. You're turning your company around and um, you're on the you're on the right track and you know but maybe you're a little bit older and and we want to bring in the hot new CEO to be under you for a couple of years and then we're going to kind of force you out and we're going to bring that other person in um, there are a lot of egos in coaching and I just don't and, and I've never met Mike Woods I've never talked with him but I can't I just knowing coaches how I do I can't imagine he'd necessarily be fired up for something like that now it could be a Purdue situation like when Matt Painter came in uh, underneath Gene Cady at Purdue and was kind of the head coach at waiting. Matt Painter was the head coach at Southern Illinois and then came into Purdue. Um, but I would think you would need the head coach's blessing to do something like that. So that would be one that I, I think that's a hard, hard pitch. And we've already seen last year, um, Mike Woodson, I think he he would prefer to have guys on his staff that you know, are his guys and um, that mesh well with him and, and that he can trust, which which makes sense. If any of us were coaches or, or you're a leader, you know, you want people around you that you trust and, and you like and you want to work with. Um, but we already saw last year, um, Dane Fife was fired as, a, as an assistant coach or, or let go or, or moved on, what, whatever the terminology is. Um, and, and I don't know if we necessarily know the inside story. I know there are people who do. I certainly don't. Um, 
if that's already kind of a, a, a precedent there, I think it's going to be a really extraordinarily tough sale to the head coach to say, okay, we're going to bring in this, this new head coach and waiting for a couple of years until your buyout goes down. Um, I, I just don't see that happening. Um, and then uh, I guess the, the last option you would have is you're going to wait. You're going to wait until um, Mike Woodson's contract is up after four years. And then you bring in Dusty May. Well, that's fine. But the risk with that is what if Dusty May can't replicate the success? What if he's just kind of a one hit wonder? Um, now, what do you do? You know, do you do, do, you do go a different route? Um, so do you strike now thinking, hey, it's going to be a home run? Do you wait and hope? But with waiting and hoping, FAU is going to be smart. We got to lock this guy up right now. And we're going to lock him into a long-term deal. And we're going to double his salary where he's going to be making basically a million dollars per year right now. Um, so that buyout is going to be even tougher to kind of keep some of those other schools at bay. Now, what we don't know and what's kind of going on behind the scenes is that coaches aren't the ones who are necessarily um, – negotiating these deals and making these deals happen. They happen through agents. And um, there was a report I saw in CBS Sports that um, agents and representatives and search firms have already reached out to Dusty May's people and trying to gauge his interest on if he's interested in leaving. And he, in so far, he's turned them all down. Well, that only kind of fuels some of that fire of, oh, he's waiting for IU, he's waiting for IU. So there's a lot of pressure that goes along in that ADC. I think it'll be interesting to see what happens. Just to kind of look at Dusty May's contract right now, as we sit here on, on April 6th, not knowing the details of, uh, of an extension he may sign. Um, he is signed through the 2026 season. His current salary right now is, uh, I believe, $450,000 or just north of $450,000, 5% increased each year. As of right now, his buyout is $600,000. So again, to go back, if we were going to buy out Mike Woodson now, we're going to owe him $12 million, and we're going to have to buy out Dusty May's contract of $600,000 um, to get him just to Bloomington. Um, not to mention, you know, there's usually bonuses involved, like moving expenses. You're going to pay for his staff to, to get here. So you're probably looking north of $13 million to bring in a new coach. Uh, is it worth it? Are you convinced that this is the guy that's going to lead you to a national championship and do it quickly? Because fan bases... Um, will turn on you in, in in a heartbeat. I mean, if you just look what's going on um, at Kentucky uh, with um, fans who are already kind of um, sick of, of John Calipari and not winning to the level that they think he needs to be winning at. Um, and Calipari is kind of an interesting, he almost kind of has like a de facto lifetime contract. So that one will be kind of an interesting one to watch. Um, so we'll see what happens there. And again, I, I'm just looking at, at Dusty May situation right now with FAU, but this goes on with schools all over the country. So I did want to bring something up here, something that I use. This is a case study that I use in class just to kind of give you an idea how some of this stuff actually works. Right? And I want to bring you the story of Northeastern University versus, um, versus Brown. And this is one that actually went through the courts. And I got my handy dandy notes here that I'm going to I'm going to bring over. But um, Don Brown, head football coach, he was under contract with Northeastern University as its football coach since 2000. In July 2003, he signed a new contract with Northeastern with the term that went through the 2007 to the 2008 season. So basically to 2008, right? Article 7 of his employment contract provided that he was not to negotiate or accept other employment during the term of his contract without first obtaining the written consent of the university president. So he could even talk to another school um, without getting written consent from the president first. So if a school wanted to come and talk with him, um, let's say, you know, he's at Northeastern, uh, let's say UConn wanted to come and, and talk with him about being the football coach, they were going to have to get written permission from the president, or at least Don Brown was going to have to get uh, permission from the president to talk with the school like UConn. A liquidated damages clause in his contract provided for a payment of $25,000 
if Brown left Northeastern before the end of his contract. So he was going to have to pay $25,000 to break his contract. Now, how this works in college sport, kind of like I just talked about, let's say UConn comes and they're like, hey, we really want you. We think you're doing a great job here up in uh, New England. Um, we want you to be our coach. Um, Brown says yes, provided that he has permission from the president. Um, UConn's going to obviously pay him a salary, and then they're going to pay that, that buyout. I mean, that's rare where coaches are going to write a $25,000 check. You know, UConn's going to pay that. So continuing the story, uh, remember, he signed a contract extension to 2008. In January 2004, Northeastern denied a request from the University of Massachusetts, UMass, to discuss employment with Brown. Nonetheless, Brown told his AD at Northeastern that UMass offered him the position of football coach and he had declined. So UMass, according to Brown, said, um, or Brown, you know, said, hey, UMass still contacted me. They wanted me to head coach, but he goes into his AD and he says, no, that's not going to happen. All right. However, three days later, Brown submitted his res resignation in order to accept employment with UMass to be the head football coach. Northeastern sued Brown, seeking a preliminary injunction to prevent Brown from coaching at UMass. So, you know, what we have here would be a, a full contract breach. Okay? Um, Don Brown is in breach of his contract with Northeastern University. He said he'd be the coach. Now he's leaving. He's not hold, holding up his end. Um, he said if he was going to interview for another uh, job that um, – um, he would get permission from the president first. Now, what's interesting here, you know, Northeastern being a small school, um, I, I wish I kind of knew the backstory on what happened here, because most schools understand, especially smaller schools understand, if you got a coach who's been successful, you know, as I talked about earlier, coaches have egos, they want to move on and they want to move up. They usually don't necessarily um, deny request for interviews. It's just kind of part of the business. You're at a small school. You do well. You want to move on. Schools kind of um, understand that. And usually they're open to you um, talking to their coach to go on to bigger and better things. Doesn't mean they like it. And doesn't mean it happens 100% of the time. But usually it's something that they're okay with. So it'd be interesting to know what's going on here um, in the in the backstory. Um, however, Brown took the job. And so what Northeastern did, they sued. And they sued because they wanted to stop Don Brown from being able to take this job. So they file a, for a preliminary injunction with the court. So now the court has to decide, was he in breach of contract? And if he was, what are the damages here? Right. So the damages would be, you know, Brown owe, owes Northeastern $25,000 and they've lost a football coach. They want him to stay on as head football coach. And courts generally can be pretty shy about having people stay somewhere in a job if they're moving on. So um, let's see what happened. So um, the ruling in this case, this went to the Superior Court of Massachusetts, and it did grant the uh, injunction for, um, for North, Northeastern University against Brown. After the ruling, Northeastern and UMass worked out a settlement. Brown was barred from coaching on the sidelines for three UMass games, and UMass paid Northeastern $150,000. Um, and so this lawsuit illustrates the type of remedy available against an employee who blatantly violates a covenant not to compete provision. So we kind of had a non-compete um, clause um, with this whole thing there. Right. So, um, you know, it, it's interesting. The court did did grant the injunction against Brown um, UMass. And, and this puts pressure on UMass. Well, now um, we just hired this guy as football coach. Now I can't coach. What are we going to do? And so um, they probably kind of held on and we're hoping that the court wouldn't rule that way. But they did. Like I said, I think a lot of times courts are a little bit shy, but um, he blatantly violated this covenant here. Um, so they did rule against them. And so UMass said, you know what, we're gonna have to pony up a little bit more to make sure that we can keep 
this guy. So um, kind of fascinating court case and just the the business of college athletics with how coaches kind of move about and the way that things are kind of done behind the scenes. It's not a normal job interview kind of um, recruiting process that a lot of us are used to in our day to day jobs. Um, there's a lot uh, that goes behind the a lot that goes on behind the scenes. A lot of people who are kind of working to place coaches in the right place. So uh, hope that kind of clears up a little bit of what happens on how you poach a coach and uh, hope it's something that you kind of found fascinating. Um, stay tuned as we go to our next segment where we talk about this week's dream job. All right, it's time for this week's dream job segment. And after a, a 20 year career and still going, in sport management, one of my favorite things to do is work with aspiring sport business professionals and trying to hook you up with places that you think you would find your fit, right? Whether it be um, in sales or marketing, accounting, finance, management, operations, broadcasting, digital advertising, whatever it would be in sport. Um, I love to try to help you kind of find your niche. So every week I'll look at a new job board, website, or just try to give you a little bit of career advice if you're looking to make that break in sports. And so today I wanted to bring you workinsports.com. Um, workinsports.com is, is one of the leading job boards in sport. Uh, the guy who runs it, Brian Clapp, I have had him speak to my classes for the past couple of years, and, and he just does a fantastic job of really breaking down what it is you need to do and work to work in sport because he's been doing it for a long time. He has been hiring and managing people for a long time in the sports space. And he provides a, a great website and a ton of great resources. Uh, check out his podcast. If you check out workinsports.com, their, their website, you can also uh, check them out on, um, on Twitter, on LinkedIn. I think on just about all the social media um, platforms you can think of, they're on there. Um, he does a great job on the on his uh, podcast, bringing on people every week uh, to talk about what their careers look like. And and listen, if you're listening to this podcast um, and you're in this space where where you're helping people with careers, hey, I'll, I'll give you a shout out. Um, I, I don't make any money on this podcast, but if you would like to advertise and and help me monetize it, I would not say no. Uh, this is just something I, I I love to do. You know, some people like to quilt, some people like to fish, some people like to hunt, or you know, whatever. Collect baseball cards. I I like podcasting and and I like making content. For me, this is fun. So, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm at the part point of my career where I can give back. Um, if anybody else that is there and and they want me to promote them, hey, shoot me a message. Let me know. Check us out on Instagram and Twitter at fof underscore show. So today I want to bring you work in sports. Now work in sports as, com as compared to some of the other uh, job boards that we looked at, like teamwork online, um, this is a paid service. Now the good thing with work in sport is that they're partnered with iHire. So they're going to bring you a ton of job listings, some that aren't listed anywhere else. So uh, if you're really trying to make that break in sport and you want to um, invest in yourself, Workinsports.com is a pretty good investment. But I wanted to bring up if you're checking us out on YouTube, and please, you know, I, I want you to listen on Spotify for the um, for the podcast. That really helps us out. Again, as we think about maybe one day monetizing this show, um, but certainly. Please go check us out on YouTube right now because I've got up the workinsports.com website and it's just YouTube um, slash FOF underscore show. I try to keep our, um, our handles all pretty consistent. But I made an account and I uploaded my resume here to work in sport. Now, the great thing is I'm in a, in a great spot where I do not need to uh, look for a job, but I did at least want to show you what it looks like if you have registered for a job. I might do the same thing with Teamwork Online here in a, in a future show. Uh, but this is basically what your, your home screen is gonna look like uh, based on your resume that you upload. It'll have some recommended jobs for you. And I'm gonna go over this week's uh, dream job. And I just have a free account. So you can see over here, my membership level is basic. Uh, my account completeness is only 30 uh, percent. So if you really wanna go in and put in more information about yourself, they can um, do it. They got an algorithm that uh, matches your skills um, to open jobs and your preferences and things you want to do with open jobs on their uh, website. And uh, in fact, I just talked with Brian 
this afternoon. And he said, right now, they've got 18,000 jobs posted. So again, if you're looking for a job, I think workinsports.com is a great place to look. Um, but one of the things I thought was pretty cool here is if you go over to resumes, you can click try our resume review tool. So I uploaded my resume here and I'm going to click on this. And then it's going to scan your resume and it's going to scan for words and, and, and phrases and formatting that HR managers are looking for. And not just that, specifically for their software. So if you've ever applied for a job, especially now, um, you're usually doing it online and it goes through their HR software. And then it's looking for keywords and key terms because you know some of these companies are getting hundreds of resumes for their job posting. So the way they filter that out is like, okay, let's look for these terms here that we absolutely have to have on a resume and then you know it's going to spit out okay well here's you know 20 people that we need to look at um, a little bit a little bit closer so i'm looking at this re resume review it says my resume review score it's great yay congratulations for me right and so formatting my layout looks good my file size and format looks good content my contact information is there employment history achievements are there um, skills all that's there. But then it looks like I've got some X's on word count, education, history, and summary. So let me click on word count. What do I need to improve? Right. My resume contains 1,276 words. Um, the recommended word count for somebody at my level, which would probably be between professional and executive, um, would be somewhere, you know, probably around a thousand words. So I, that might be something I need to cut down because again, you know, hiring managers don't want to sit there and read three pages of stuff. Education history. There's a problem found there. Um, looking at my PhD listed, they say um, it doesn't say um, where or uh, my school was or, or um, when I earned my degree. That's because it's still in progress. Right. Summary. Right. It says my resume is lacking an introductory summary paragraph. However, take this from somebody who has read a lot of, a lot of resumes and has hired people. And in fact, Brian just said the same thing um, when I was talking to him this, this afternoon. You do not need a summary. Now, if you're brand new to the workforce and you know your your resume could basically fit on a post-it uh, post note and you want to put a summary on there and what you're looking for um, and in your skills and background you can do that that makes sense however if you're applying to a job that i posted i know you want to work for me you don't have to put a summary i, I know what you're doing right so a lot of times that stuff it's just it gets glossed over don't worry about that right um, and there's other things that they'll go over in your uh, resume review there. So it's kind of cool. But let's go to this week's dream job. So you're on workinsports.com. You've got your free account and you're checking things out. Um, this week's dream job is going to be the eSports head coach at Purdue University, Fort Wayne. Pretty cool job. Okay. Um, now, what you're going to notice when I click on this and you go to this job here, it does have... It does say what the position is, esports head coach, and where it's at, right? Purdue University here in Fort Wayne. However, the job description and the ability to apply are locked unless you get a premium account. So you're going to have access to apply to these jobs with a premium account. So if that's something that you're looking for, you can do that. Now, you know, I, I don't want to cut Brian's legs out from under him because I really respect him and, and I think he does a, a great job. Um, but, you know, if you're a, a savvy Internet user or certainly a savvy job hunter, um, you're going to know how to use workinsports.com to look up jobs with titles you might be interested in. And then you're going to kind of figure out pretty easily how to go find the application portal. So like I know for Purdue Fort Wayne um, specifically, um, even if it was linked here in workinsports.com, you would not apply through workinsports.com. You would have to apply through their actual um, portal. So, you know, there's certainly ways uh, to skirt that. But if you're looking for a place where you can find the largest amount of jobs and get some feedback on your resume and, and find jobs custom tailored to you, check out workinsports.com. 
And then if you're interested um, and you've got a background in esports, this is an industry that's growing by leaps and bounds right now. Um, I think back in 2016, I believe it was projected to be the second most watched sport by 2020. And um, I don't have updated numbers in front of me, but I know it's in the top five. And it was projected to be number two right behind the NFL. Um, colleges are starting esports teams, and you can get scholarship, a scholarship to play esports um, or to participate in esports at the college level. Um, you could go pro. So um, a former esports uh, coach that I knew on, at the college level, he was a professional player in South Korea for a couple years. Um, and it was interesting talking with him how intense it is as an esports participant. Because I mean, you're practicing hours and hours and hours each day. And while it might not necessarily be physically draining, um, it's certainly uh, mentally draining. Um, and you can imagine sitting that long, you do need to get up and you need to move. And he said, you know, we did actually uh, uh, work out just to kind of help keep us a little bit sharp because physical fitness has um, been shown to, to help with brain activity as well. So um, there's so much that goes into esports and so many different games and, and new platforms coming about um, that I think it's really an exciting time to get in that. And there's going to be a lot of opportunities uh, going forward. So if you're an esports professional and, and you probably, I'm going to assume for a job like this, because it's so new, you don't need to have a ton of experience. But if you've got a couple of years experience as an esport professional, check out this job, head coach, esports, Purdue University, Fort Wayne's with the Mastodons here in beautiful Fort Wayne, Indiana. So that's going to do it this week. Um, hope you enjoyed the show. Have a great Easter. I'm looking forward. I already know what the topic's going to be next Friday. Um, we're starting to get into marathon season. So we got the Boston Marathon coming up. Um, we've got the London Marathon coming up. And I'm going to talk to you next week about how to run a world major marathon. I'm going to give you a little bit of my experience after having run in four of them. Now, I know it doesn't look like it if you're looking at me on YouTube. I'm getting a little bit down here in the, in the neck and a little bit of that uh, uh, chicken neck there. But I'll run it off in the summer, I promise. Hey, have a great Easter. Thanks for tuning in. Check us out, Twitter, Instagram, at FOF underscore show. Remember, love each other, love God, be a good sport. See you next week.